The Roby House was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright in about 1909. Frederick Roby bought a standard city lot, rectangular in shape and rather narrow. The shape of this site partly determined the long, narrow form of the house. Wright believed that a building should be an integral part of its environment. It should harmonize with the surrounding landscape and appear to belong naturally to its site. The Chicago terrain is flat prairie, hence the houses Wright built in this area are called prairie houses. The dominant lines are horizontal. Long and low, they echo the flatness of the prairie. The Roby House is considered the culmination of the prairie house. We can see how the prairie house developed during the 1890s and early 1900s by looking at some earlier houses by Wright in the Chicago area. The Gale House in Oak Park dates from 1892, while Wright was still in Sullivan's office. It is a timber house in the shingle-style tradition. But already one can see Wright's interest in the dominant roof, which has almost as much visual importance as the lower part of the house. At the Goodrich House of 1896, another essentially traditional design, more individual Wrightian hallmarks are already emerging. Here, the strong roof line is simplified and its mass broken only by a single dormer. The top floor is treated as a separate linear element, separating roof from lower area like a frieze. The top windows have Wright's characteristic leaded panes and a one-story bay projects forward to one side, disrupting the symmetry of the main block. The Winslow House, built in 1893 in River Forest, is by comparison much less traditional, and its forms and lines are much simplified. For the first time, the dominant lines are horizontal, the low-pitched roof which seems almost to float above the rest of the house, the dark brown terracotta frieze under the eaves, the one-story projecting port cochere or covered entranceway on the left side, the thin Roman bricks of the lower part of the house. Although Wright has not abandoned symmetry or formality, the elegant Winslow house already has an abstract quality, as though the various elements, such as door, windows, roof, and chimney, have been arranged according to principles of geometry. With the design of the Hurtley House of 1902, Wright began to move away from symmetry. Like the Winslow House, the Hurtley House has a low-pitched roof, central chimney mass, and general horizontality of line. The material is dark brick, banded by a lighter brick. The house begins to relate closely to its site, with the low walls extending sideways to define the garden, and forward to form an entrance patio by the arched doorway. Leaded casement windows are arranged frieze-like in a continuous band under the projecting eaves. The Thomas House of 1901 shows similar qualities. Here, Wright has used parallel roof planes and a projecting side wing, which makes the ground floor roof L-shaped. Again, there are leaded windows, horizontal lines, and a central chimney. The W. E. Martin House of 1903 shows an increasingly more complex organization of architectural forms. There are now three distinct roof levels, and the house itself can be subdivided into six horizontal sections. All of these are interrelated in a subtle, abstract way, almost like a piece of sculpture. Window bands are outlined in dark trim, and one wing projects away from the three-story mass to hug the ground. The low spreading quality of the Prairie House is fully developed in the house right design for his assistant and secretary, Isabel Roberts, in 1908. 
The low brick walls trimmed with concrete bands are sheltered by hovering roofs. Long wings project outward from the two-story centerpiece in several directions, echoing the flat prairie site. The roof planes seem to move in relation to each other as one moves round the house. All the lines are straight, and the dominant formal element, a long rectangle. Frederick Roby decided to build his new house here, near the university, because his wife was a graduate and there was a growing intellectual community which they found sympathetic. This house was built in the city of Chicago, but in 1909 the area, though not open country, was much less built up than it is now. The main views to the south were still open. Roby was an engineer and president of a company that made bicycles. He had an independent turn of mind and had definite ideas about what he wanted in his house. He soon found that Wright was the only architect who could design the sort of house he envisaged. I wanted rooms without interruptions. I wanted the windows without curvature and doodads inside and out. I wanted all the daylight I could get in the house, but shaded enough by overhanging eaves to protect me from the weather. I wanted sunlight in the living room in the morning before I went to work, and I wanted to be able to look out and down the street to my neighbors without having them invade my privacy. I certainly didn't want a lot of junk, a lot of fabrics, draperies, and whatnot or old-fashioned roller shades with the brass fittings on the ends in my line of vision, gathering dust and interfering with window washing. The living and dining rooms are on the first floor. The living room on the left and the dining room on the right. The bedrooms are at the top of the house. The children's playroom and the billiard room occupied the ground floor. The kitchen, servants' quarters, and garages were in a separate block attached to the house. There were garages for three cars underneath. The long horizontal lines are reflected in nearly every detail of the Roby house. The roofs are another dominating horizontal element. They are broad and flat, with wide projecting eaves. They seem to hover protectively over the mass of the house. They throw deep shadows over the balconies below. All this is reminiscent of Japanese architecture which Frank Lloyd Wright had seen in 1893 at the Columbian Exposition in Chicago, held not far from here. The narrow, elongated parapets and balconies are of thin Roman brick. They are banded by horizontal strips of concrete. This angular projection looks like the prow of a ship, and the balconies like sun decks. There are hardly any curved lines in the whole house. Almost all the angles are 90 degrees, except for the pitch of the roof. There is one dominant vertical mass, the chimney. This is the heart of the house, and one of the most striking features on the outside. Inside, as we'll see, the fireplace and hearth are equally essential to the shape of the interior. Everywhere, horizontal planes seem to move about and interpenetrate. The relationship between horizontal and vertical planes is echoed in every small detail. This entrance area is just a small-scale example of this geometrical principle. 
The entrance itself is on the north side of the house. It isn't very imposing. In fact, if you didn't know where it was, you might walk all the way round the house before you found it. This modest entrance shows the sort of informality Roby wanted. Inside, there is a small entrance hall, which is now used as offices, as is most of the rest of the house. You might expect the main living rooms to be down here, but in fact they're upstairs. Down here there was originally a billiard room on this side, and over there a children's playroom. But the first thing you notice as you come in the house is this staircase that leads up to the main living area. Here, just where the staircase begins, there is a semicircular hole in the ceiling one of the few curved elements in the whole house. Putting the main rooms on the first floor was not a new idea. It goes back to Italian Renaissance architecture and the Piano Nobile. Roby wanted his living rooms up here to take advantage of the view to the south. This is the living room. Let's look first at the fireplace, the heart of all right houses, and for him, the focal point of all American houses. Wright conceived of his houses as living organisms, with the fireplace as the central life-giving element. The sense of warmth, shelter, and protection is always foremost. The shape of the fireplace can be understood as a reflection of the exterior composition in miniature. It is built of brick with concrete bands and is the only place in the house where brick, the material Wright uses on the exterior, comes inside. The geometric interplay of lines extends to these magnificent iron fire dogs. And even the bricks themselves are elongated and horizontal. There is the same subtle interplay of geometric volumes in the detailing here and in the almost perverse open space left above the fireplace itself, which connects the room I am sitting in with the next one. The whole of the room is a carefully planned and subtly moulded space. It is long and narrow with a strong east-west axis which ends in this prow-like projecting bay. These strips of oak panelling have the same effect as exposed ceiling beams and restrain this strong east-west force. They go round all the windows and tie them together at the top. This was a device Wright was very fond of. The window tops are very low, about seven feet, and by drawing a dark wood line along the top of them at this level, Wright makes the human scale the point of reference. The ceiling itself is much higher in the middle, about ten feet, but it doesn't seem at all cold and lofty because of the way the wood has been used. Along the sides of the room where the ceiling is about a foot lower, Wright has placed these patterned wood grills. Each grill design is slightly different in detail, though most of these have been damaged. They conceal certain services, pipes, wires, recessed lighting, and the steel girders that support the long roof. Abstract patterns of light and shadow are thrown onto walls, bricks, and floors by these lights. Other details form their own abstract patterns.
The main light fittings are these round globes enclosed in square wooden frames. Another rare use of curved form, this time a perfect sphere inside a perfect square. Incidentally, these lights were operated by a dimmer switch, an early use of this device. The light frames, like all the wood in the house, are oak, and these fittings again repeat the theme of interpenetrating geometric volumes. All the original furniture was designed by Wright, but unfortunately most of it has disappeared from the Roby house, probably because it was so uncomfortable. None of the furniture here is original, but this sofa is a copy of one by Wright and gives you an idea of what it was like. The wooden sides come up to form side tables in an ingenious way. This piece is so heavy that it's nearly impossible to move. Perhaps Wright designed it deliberately this way so his clients would have to leave the furniture arranged as he decreed. The chairs and tables were of oak and very heavy and architectonic. All the windows on the south side are French windows, and originally it was possible to open all of them onto the terrace. The glass in the window is stained and held in place by zinc tracery. Wright used sharp, jagged angles for his window patterns. The effect of this is to break up the exterior light and give a series of ever-changing images of the exterior landscape. Also, the patterning enriches the interior and enhances the effect of warmth and enclosure. When all the doors are open, they act like a folding retractable screen. The effect is more enclosed than if he had used plate glass, and more subtle, too. Nature can be enjoyed, but kept at bay. Although there was no garden, Wright incorporated these planters and urns into the house. These unusual plants, with their dramatic shadows, play a part in his total design. He had the brick specially made in St. Louis, and the pointing deliberately emphasizes the horizontal effect. Wright was always conscious of the inherent qualities of materials. Bronze, concrete, brick, glass, and zinc. Wood, too, is used on the exterior. It seems to connect outside and inside. The effect inside is one of comfort, of protection. But is this just one room? There are no corners by the fireplace. The wooden ceiling strips the lights and the windows continue through to the dining room. We are in one continuous flowing space, here punctuated by another arrow-like bay at the east end. These old photographs show the dining room as it was originally furnished. The massive oak table and straight-back chairs must have been very uncomfortable. The lights on the corner post provided muted illumination for the table. The carpet was specially woven to write specifications in Austria. These wall lights were of yet another design with elaborate patterning on top, out of view. In here, Wright designed built-in sideboards, again of oak. The kitchen very conveniently opened off here beyond the dining room. The three bedrooms for the family were upstairs. 
but these two are now used as offices. Each bedroom had its own fitted wardrobe, and each wardrobe had a window in it because Roby disliked dark, dingy cupboards. Another old photograph shows the children's playroom, which was downstairs. Apparently, the family used this room for all their old Victorian furniture from houses they had lived in earlier. It's certainly not the kind of furniture Wright would have chosen for the house. house was built as early as 1909 because it looks so modern. The lines are uncluttered, and the only ornaments are these integral flower boxes, which had their own watering system built in. Through this house, Wright had a tremendous influence on European architects. He was especially admired by Dutch architects, and the de Staal movement in Holland owes quite a lot to his innovations, as does the Bauhaus, though more indirectly. Wright never forgot that a house must be, first of all, a convenient, well-engineered place to live. But he also conceived of architecture in abstract sculptural terms, line, space, volume. And it was these abstract qualities of space and volume that particularly appealed to architects abroad. The Dutch architect, J.J.P. Oud, writing in 1925 about Wright's influence on the architecture of Europe. Free from all the finicky detail work which undermined the architecture of the ancient world, notwithstanding exotic peculiarities, fascinating for all the simplicity of the motifs, Wright's work convinced at once So firm of structure, for all their movability, were the piled up masses growing, as it were, out of the soil. So natural was the interlacing of the elements, shifting as on a cinematographic screen. So reasonable was the arrangement of the spaces that nobody doubted the inevitable necessity of this form language for ourselves, too, since it was assumed, as a matter of course, that practicalness and comfort had here been combined into a beautiful synthesis in the only manner possible in our day, that Wright the artist had achieved what Wright the prophet had professed. 